Bream is the ultimate guitar hero. Technically brilliant, there's an astounding sensitivity to his playing. A virtuoso and a showman, in his 50-year career, Bream pioneered the place of the classical guitar in British musical life. In this program, we'll see and hear three decades of great guitar and lute performances from the BBC archives. From the intimacy of Bach, to the energy of William Walton. We'll explore his roots in the hot jazz of Django Reinhardt. And discover how he revived the long-forgotten Elizabethan lute repertoire. There are duets with his great friend John Williams. And through the magic of television, he even duets with himself. Good looking, with sparkling eyes and the curl of a smile never far from his lips, Julian Bream has always been a hugely popular figure, the antithesis of the highbrow, remote classical artist. In 1962, the seminal arts programme Monitor followed him on tour. The most uh, important thing, and certainly the most satisfying thing about playing the guitar, certainly as far as I'm concerned, is the intimate contact one has with the strings. Not just with the left hand, but with the right hand. And because of this intimate contact with the strings, one has at one's disposal most wonderful varieties of colour. Uh, you can get piquant shades, you see, like this. Well, you can get a normal tone colour of the guitar. Or a harp-like velvet quality. And if you really want, want the effect, you can make a pizzicato sound like this. What about a bark fellow? Bark fellow.
Julian Bream is London-born and London-bred. He comes from Battersea and he lives in Kensington. His friends are artists, sculptors, businessmen and barmaids. He's meeting people all the time on his job and the job takes him all over the world. Darlington one week and Rome the next. Well, cheers everybody and a best of luck. And if he's not meeting his friends here in the Fulham Road, then as likely as not, it'll be at his own flat. It's a kind of regular thing, Julian Bream's on a Saturday night. This is where it all began for Julian Bream, with the music of Django Reinhardt, the gypsy guitarist who made the Hot Club of France so famous in the 30s and 40s. This was the kind of music that Julian Bream grew up with. was the first instrument that Bream learned as a boy. By the time he was 11, he was taking lessons on Saturday mornings at the Royal College of Music. After my lessons, I used to pop onto a bus, toddle across Battersea Bridge, and visit my grandma at her pub. This is all that's left of my grandma's pub, and up against that wall was the old piano. And it was on this piano that I used to uh, play on a Saturday night. And, uh, well, I used to sometimes make five bob if I was lucky. They used to have a whip round on the cap. Well, in those days, it was very good money. When I first began to play the guitar, it was not the classical guitar, but the jazz guitar. I had already given my Wigmore Hall debut in 51, and my career was really getting underway, but unfortunately, I was called up for my national service in 1952. Run! As the Korean War was on, I was on draft, for career, in fact, and I really didn't fancy taking lutes and guitars out to that sort of climate, apart from the thing, in fact, the thing may have got blown up, too. So I had to find another posting and I was accepted into the Royal Artillery Band at Woolwich on the basis of a three-year engagement with the Colours. It's amazing that I was accepted at all because, I mean, what could the guitar do in a military band? I mean, I couldn't go on the march playing the guitar. So I quickly got myself an amplifier and I drew a guitar from the stores, <laughs> if you can believe it, and uh, put a magnet underneath the strings uh, and away I went, and about once a week, mostly in the winter time, I would be playing in a dance band. I had an extraordinary career in the army because as soon as I got posted to Woolwich, I promptly got myself a flat in Kensington. And I found that if I paid somebody to look after my bed space in the barracks, I could live at my flat in Kensington and drive down every morning, be on parade by nine o'clock, and it would appear that I was just an ordinary, regular soldier. And on my leave, I used to travel abroad, and I did concerts, which was totally illegal. 
Bream's background of Battersea and jazz, his concert work as a guitarist, and his terrific vitality have taken him to the 16th century and the forgotten world of the lute, an instrument that's been out of the public mind for over 300 years. This particular lute has 14 strings, and it's a copy of an instrument dated 1585. Shall we now go on to the last movement? That was a bit quick, George. What do you think? Oh, I don't know. Not, not, for, not for general purposes. When you go into a concert, for example, have you got all your colours worked out beforehand? No. Uh, I never work out the colouring or the registration of my pieces before I go onto the platform. I leave that absolutely spontaneously to the performance. So that no two performances are ever exactly the same? Never. Well, at least I hope they're not. You've got to, if you like, be a little bit reckless. In the early 50s, when he went to the Royal College of Music, Julian Bream wasn't allowed to study the guitar. Don't bring that instrument into this building, the director told him. By 1963, the instrument had gained a measure of respectability. Here's Bream with the English composer Malcolm Arnold discussing how they came to collaborate on a guitar concerto. The anchorman is Richard Attenborough. Malcolm, tell me, it seems to me knowing very little about it, but it's a unique occasion having composer mm. and soloist here. This is a very quiet instrument. And therefore, it oh, seems yes. to me that it would be very difficult to write a concerto for such an instrument. Yes, it's difficult. It's very easy to drown the, yeah. the guitar. But, yeah. it's, I mean, the technical thing of the side of the guitar is, is a difficult thing to understand. Yes. It's a very subtle instrument. Yes. But the reason I wrote for the guitar anyway, mm. for Julian in particular, mm. is that I admire him, I should think, almost more than any other musician uh, living to put it mildly. Yeah. But I didn't like him to know. He's quite conceited enough, as it is. <laughs> so don't tell him, for goodness sake. <laughs> Thank you. 
was a great virtuoso, no doubt about that. He was also a showman, a brilliant entertainer, but he was a musical pioneer as well. His eponymous consort brought back to life the long-forgotten music written for the lute, and his work performing Elizabethan music paved the way for a full-scale early music revival in the 1970s and 80s. A dance arrangement for full consort of John Darlin's famous, well-known song, can she excuse my wrongs? Which was sometimes called, in the instrumental version, the Earl of Essex Galliard. when you think that this music was written between 1580 and 1615, just 35 years. And of course, 
This is really the, the reason why I'm so stimulated, because I feel that one should resuscitate the sort of deadness of our musical life. I think deadness. musicians decide to make music together, the result can only be extraordinary and unique. Well, this evening we have the privilege to receive as our guests two of the most celebrated classical guitarists. Ladies and gentlemen, Julian Bream and John Williams. <laughs> Bye. 
more from that extraordinary partnership of Julian Bream and John Williams later on in the programme. It seems in the 70s as if Bream was never really off the nation's TV screens. Julian Bream left London in the mid-1960s to move to Semley, a pretty village on the Wiltshire-Dorset border near the town of Shaftesbury. A decade after he'd moved, the BBC followed him to the country. Perhaps I ought to try the taste The truth of the matter is, Bream has a secret ambition. He is acknowledged everywhere as a great guitarist. That is indisputable. Very nice. Well, I have a But is the world ready to recognise his talents on the cricket field? The opponents declare, having knocked up a formidable score. But here comes Bream, and everyone is confident he can play a captain's innings. Last man in, and everything depends on him. 36 runs scored, 75 needed to win. Oh dear, oh dear. This is a sad day for English cricket. why an international virtuoso shouldn't live in the country, providing he plans his touring very carefully. In fact, I plan my tours around the pruning and, indeed, the fresh vegetables. <laughs> Terrific. I think there is something fascinating about pluck sound. The plucked instruments, most of them, if not all, come from the East. And perhaps it's to do with Eastern mysticism and religious experience. But plucked sound has a remarkable quality because the actual pluck itself is the apex of the sound. And thereafter, it dies. And if you are playing, say, a phrase of six or seven notes, you are dealing really with six or seven births and six or seven deaths. 
We hate death and we don't know how to deal with it. So in fact, we sustain our lives as long as possible. Come on, Hosse, bowl me one of those googlies. One solid clunk on those hands could put an end to his career for good. Naturally, it's a terrific risk, but I feel that I must live. I must do things with my hands. After all, my hands must be strong, particularly my left hand. In a sense, I don't want to cosset them too much because I think one can upset a certain equilibrium and cause accidents. I don't really bother with insurance because I like to think in some sense I'm a practical person. I believe that to some extent one's in the lap of the gods. <laughs> of the lute to the other instruments is very interesting. It never has the tune, but it has so much of the texture. Also, it gives so much of the pace. Believe it or not, all the divisions and fast-running passages in my lute part are all written down. Many people think I make them up, but these Elizabethan players must have been every bit as good as myself, and possibly a bit better. sound, isn't it? I'm afraid to say so when the loop comes in.
thanks to 1970s television magic, Julian Bream was able to partner himself in a duet for two lutes by John Dowland. Take four. Another visitor to the country was his old friend John Williams. As John Williams once recalled, although the way we each play is as alike as chalk and cheese, we're not two musicians, we're an ensemble and we create magic together.
Reams' relationship with John Williams grew ever closer. There were recitals, international tours. They made an album called, quite simply, Together. Here they are together again in the glorious chapel of Wardour Castle, near Bream's country residence. <laughs> composer who wrote for Julian Bream was William Walton. Bream commissioned him to write a set of bagatelles. Not that the process was entirely straightforward, as the guitarist explained to Barry Norman on the BBC's Omnibus. I commissioned these pieces, and it, William, of course, takes a long time. You know, he's, I was going to ask about he's, that. He's yeah. famous for, you know, um, getting up and, in the morning and, and writing three notes, and then going back in the afternoon and... Uh, rubbing one of them out, you know. But I think suddenly, I think he had a great difficulty trying to start these pieces. But once he got into it, uh, I think it all flowed pretty quickly for him. And uh, what is interesting is that the writing is absolutely marvellous for the instrument.
As we reach the end of this rich collection of Julian Bream's appearances at the BBC, let's see him on the biggest stage the corporation can provide, the stage of the Royal Albert Hall. Here he is at the BBC Proms in 1991, playing that guitar concerto that Malcolm Arnold wrote for him in the 1950s. <laughs>
first movement of Malcolm Arnold's guitar concerto, Julian Bream playing at the BBC Proms in 1991. He retired from concerts in 2002. I felt I'd done enough, he said at the time. After all, I'd been on stage for 55 years. His legacy is absolutely clear. He brought the lute back to life after it had practically disappeared for two centuries. And he turned the guitar into a real force in our concert life. We'll finish with Julian Bream playing in glorious shadow, a recording from the early 60s as he plays music by his Brazilian hero, Villa Lobos. Thank you. 